All right, everybody, I think it's time to go ahead and get started. Happy Tuesday and happy Valentine's Day if you celebrate that kind of thing. I posted some fun Valentine's Day facts on our BNB LinkedIn page. Go take a look if you're curious about those. And while you're at it, be sure to follow the BNB LinkedIn page. John Kamen, Sherry Dozier, and Bill Bartels have prepared an excellent presentation, this time about good information for bad faith claims handling. We are now offering MCLE and CE credit during these monthly webinars for California attorneys and claims examiners. All attendees, and this is important, all attendees must be on the webinar, able to see the slide presentation, and attend for the entire hour to receive credit. Again, you must watch the presentation in order to receive credit. We are not providing credit if you called in only. Visit our website at bradfordbarthel.com for tons of information about BNB and all of our value added services. I just want to mention a few of them very quickly. Our training page has over 80 hours of continuing education credits available to claims examiners. Additionally, you can register for upcoming webinars. Our March webinar is available for registration now. Our BNB blog is pretty awesome. I think John's probably going to talk about it too. Our attorneys write an average of two new articles a week on current workers' compensation topics. Have you heard about our AMA analysis and rating department? I'm sure you have, right? The department fully analyzes and annotates medical reports shortcomings, outlining sections that either need to be bolstered or undercut, depending on the client's objective. So check out our rating department if you haven't. In your go-to webinar panel, you're going to find a handout section. In that handout section, we have uploaded a PDF copy of today's PowerPoint presentation. Additionally, the PowerPoint is posted on our training page under today's topic. If you have any questions at all during today's presentation, please enter them in the questions section and we will do our best to get those answered for you. Um, our speakers have a lot they want to share today, so I think we should jump into today's uh, intros and then right into the presentation. Uh, David, would you like to start us off today? Uh, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Lim, and I'm the managing attorney here in the Santa Rosa office. Um, been here for about, ah, it's getting close to 10 years, if not a little more, but um, we do service Santa Rosa, Ukiah, San Francisco, and Oakland. Um, so definitely, if uh, you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm available by email, cell phone, and I believe that's all on our website. So um, thank you. Hey, you and I'll, I'll take it from there, David. Thank you. My name is Bill Bartels, the dogless Bill Bartels, as I've had my red <laughs> nose rubbed in it. I wore my pink tie today to celebrate Valentine's Day because nothing makes me love my wife more than a, a Hallmark or a flower company telling me to do so. Uh, I work again out of the Anaheim office. Uh, we service Santa Ana, Anaheim, and Long Beach boards primarily, but we also go to Marina del Rey sometimes at Long Beach and some others. So uh, happy to take your questions also. We got a lot to tell you today, so I'll pass it over to John. Thank you, Bill, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Kamen, and I'm a equity partner in the Woodland Hills office of Bradford and Barthel. And as Tammy mentioned, I'm also the director of the editorial board, which is a fancy way of saying that I run the firm's blog. And if you have any great blog ideas or any things, uh, common issues or frequent issues, that have been bugging you, feel free to ask us. Uh, often those questions from you, our audience, are really our best blog ideas. So we actually get our best stuff from you. So if you do have any ideas or questions, uh, feel free to send, send them our way. And um, as far as my background, I worked for WorkComp Central for about six or seven years. Uh, there I was the legal editor and I covered uh, legislation in all 50 states as well as appellate case law and workers' comp in all 50 states as well. And so with that being said, I'm going to kick it over to Sherry to get us started. Good afternoon, everybody. So good to be here. Um, this is going to be, I think, an interesting topic uh, for all of you. It certainly is for me. Uh, I have been with the firm for 23 years uh, in the industry, 37. I started when I was uh, 10 years old, just so you're all aware of that. And I'm a certified specialist in workers' comp, and I also specialize in large loss cases. And I'm a consultant for uh, you guys 
on state audits. Um, what I would love for you to do is if you get an, a unique situation in an audit, uh, my contact information is certainly on this PowerPoint, um, give me an email and say what happened because I like to keep up to date. I, I've helped a lot of clients the last several, about over 20 years uh, through audits. And it's always good to know the next uh, subject that the audit unit is going to focus on. So with that being said, um, I'm going to hand it back over to Tammy. We have some poll questions that we'd like to start with. Yes, and you should already see the first one on your screen. As a claims professional, do you usually develop a gut feeling about an applicant and their motivations? And attorneys can answer this too, obviously. Do you usually develop a gut feeling about an applicant and their motivations? I'm just going to give this a few more seconds. Sorry, we're going to run through these kind of fast because we have a lot to cover today. So I apologize if you all didn't get to vote, but I'm going to go ahead and close that and share the results. Sherry, it looks like 93% say yes. That's great. Uh, probably every single person that's presenting today could say the same thing. So mm -hmm. thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Number two. Does your gut feeling in any way inform your claims decisions? Quick and easy, yes or no. Does your gut feeling in any way inform your claims decisions? And we appreciate you guys participating in our polls. They're very helpful. It looks like, I'm going to give it another second here, but it looks like this one's pretty split, Sherry. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead and share the results now, but it's 53% say yes. Okay. Okay. That's, okay. that's great. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good to know. Thank you. How do you feel when you know there are exaggerations and misrepresentations in a case? Is it just acceptance? This is how the system works? Are you mad you're going to get more evidence or are you kind of neutral, not really sure what to feel or do? How do you feel when you know there are exaggerations and misrepresentations in a case? A couple more seconds. I see that you guys are getting faster at this. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to share those results. So Sherry, 51% say they get mad 25 acceptance and 24 neutral wow and our, yeah and our final question of the day and i think the most important one you guys I hope you're ready it is it. it's a really <laughs> good one how often do you throw office equipment now i want you to really think about this is it once a day once an hour once a week or define office equipment do you often throw, or how often do you throw office equipment? Once a day, and you can't throw your dogs. You know, we were just talking about dogs. You can throw your office equipment, <laughs> but not your dogs. Now, everyone wants to vote for this one, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very popular answer, and the answer is 84% say define office equipment. Thank you all. That's great. <laughs> Thank you for that. Consider that um, in lieu of Don Barthel's joke that he normally tells at the beginning. That was from John. Thank you, John, for that. I thought it was so funny, so I'm glad we included it. Um, let's jump into the material. We do have a lot to cover. Um, and again, we'll get to your questions as we can during the presentation, but certainly beyond the presentation, we're still all available. So let's start with what is bad faith? You know, just what is it? It's intentional deception or dishonesty, intentional failure to meet obligations, intentional defraud or deceived another, intentionally defrauding or deceiving another person, neglect of fair dealing standards. So you notice the majority of the words are intentional. You know a fact to be a certain way, but you want it to be another way. Um, and you're going to lean that direction. And so it becomes an intention. So what is good faith then? You know, we know what bad faith is. It's many things and some of the, the ones that I listed. But bad or good faith is honesty. When you know facts, you present them as, as they are. Fairness, 
uh, lawfulness, lawfulness to society in general and lawfulness within the claims system uh, without intention to defraud or act maliciously and without taking unfair advantage of an injured person or an applicant attorney, I know don't laugh too hard, or someone you know in the industry where you know a fact pattern and you're presenting it you know, in the way that um, it's good faith. So the WCAB definition really comes down to this, and then this has been in a lot of cases that I've read, um, good faith tactics or dealings. That's really what the WCAB is looking for. Um, acting from the evidence and not man manipulating an outcome, not misleading opposing counsel, um, applicants, especially co-defendants, judges, to achieve a desired outcome. So what are the takeaways? Um, it's okay to disagree and state your position. Throw a couple office equipment, however you define them. Um, it's okay to pursue further evidence to prove your point. Because following your gut in claims, I know I was in claims for many, many years before I came to uh, Bradford's office, and you do start out with a gut feeling, and that's totally fine. Um, but you need a willingness and an understanding, which was fascinating about the uh, one of the poll questions. There was a tendency to, sac to say that I don't define what I'm going to do just by the way I feel. So that's very interesting. And um, it kind of lends itself to what the topic is today. So it's okay to stand on factual denial, even though Akiomi states compensability. Um, and involve your super supervisors, your management team. Uh, you're not in this alone. You have a lot of people to support you, including Bradford Barthel. John, I thought you had an example on this. I'm going to move on because I think it, um, so it's not okay to misrepresent the evidence to gain a desired outcome. Let's move on to um, Labor Code 129.5. Um, this section really provides for administrative penalties. Um, they can be used for specific conduct. And, and let me give you some examples. Example A2 allows for penalties for failure to pay uh, the undisputed portion of indemnity, um, the reasonable cost of medical treatment, and we're not so much in vogue rehab, but although you could consider a voucher something that you could be um, receive a penalty for. Uh, just really the, the cost of providing the benefits. Subsection E is where um, it really does get troubling. In addition to a penalty assessment, um, in the first one that I read, the administrative director can assess a civil penalty not to exceed $100,000 if the administrative director finds after a hearing, you have a, a process that you go through for the, before these penalties become fi final. But if after hearing, it's determined that you are knowingly committing or performing um, with sufficient frequency, they do look at frequency, something of an egregious nature or neglect or the other things that we spoke about earlier, it becomes a general business practice um, question. And that is as follows. It included employees to uh, accept less than, like inducing them to accept less than compensation due or made it necessary for the employee to resort to proceeding uh, against the employer to secure compensation. Now, this isn't really the regular litigation process where maybe the employee feels that they're not being compensated as much as they'd like. This is where you knowingly know that it's compensable and you just deny benefits. You will not pay them. Um, so think of it more in those terms. Now, am I here to tell you that maybe opposing counsel may raise the issue? Um, I had a case that I just heard of um, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, that opposing counsel filed for penalties on a topic that the fact pattern didn't even seem like it was good faith for him to to file so it goes both ways good good faith is everyone in this industry um, 
refused to comply with known and legally indisputed compensation obligations. Discharge or administered compensation obligations in a dishonest manner. Discharge or administered compensation obligations in a manner as to cause injury to the public or those dealing with the employer or insurer. So there is a full compliance audit. We start off with what's called a PAR audit. And that is just a basic audit. It goes over some standard categories that the audit unit looks at to make sure all of you, and I'm sure all of you have already had that fun experience, um, but it makes sure that all of you are in compliance. So, but if you go past that PAR audit and you go into the first full compliance portion, um, which is a, another added performance standards, and you fail to meet two consecutive full compliance audits, then it is going to be rebuttably presumed, but presumed nonetheless, to be a general business practice, which causes injury to those that you're dealing with. And it could be any of the parties that I mentioned before. If this occurs, watch out for substantial civil claims citing this practice. If there's a second or subsequent filing of this business practice, um, then the matter goes to insurance commissioner and you really don't want to have this happen because you can have your certificates of self-insurance. Your whole entire business could really be questioned and potentially uh, penalized for the consecutive business process. So moving on to actually the penalties, uh, pursuant to 814.6, and this is under the code 10112.2, the schedule of administrative penalties uh, pursuant to Labor Code 48, uh, 58, excuse me, 14.6. Um, and that is really in relationship to, to Labor Code 5814. I'm sure most of you have seen a 5814 penalty petition by applicant attorney or by even a lien claimant looking for additional benefits to punish you. So we'll get into the 5814 specifics of just a few minutes later, a few slides later. But let's really go through the penalties. What, you know, what are we talking about? Why, why do we really care about this? First of all, we care because we want to do the right thing. But secondly, this is not free. This you know, comes with consequences. So after more than one penalty award is issued by the WCAB, uh, applicable on or after June 1, 2004, and based on conduct. Remember that word conduct occurring on or after April 19th, 2004. I think there's some other things that exploded um, April 19th of 2004, so uh, quite the data pick. Um, unreasonable delay or refusal to pay compensation within a five-year time period. So the five-year period of time shall begin the date of the issuance of any penalty award not previously subject to an administrative penalty assessment under the code we're talking about 5814.6. So the Division of Workers' Compensation, DWC, um, is they are to, at minimum, submit copies on a monthly basis to the audit unit of those orders that have not been been followed. Um, and that's regarding Labor Code 5814. Those go to the audit unit. And the audit unit obtains monthly 5814 activity reports. So they're very well aware, and if any of you have ever been through a target audit or been through an audit that there was a complaint on a file or a petition filed that kind of went a little bit further, than you would have liked, that is what is happening. It was referred to the audit unit and then they are required to investigate. But they must first determine if the award was final before they can take the next step. And if more than one final penalty award has been issued on or after June 1 of 2004 um, in a single location, a single adjusting locations, Think of how many adjusting locations some of your businesses have. And so each location can be affected differently and can contribute to that overall picture. And at that point, the audit unit may proceed with an investigation. We never like to see that coming our way. It's hard enough to get through a PAR audit. 
I think most of you will, will agree with that. Um, to determine whether a violation described by this code 5814.6 has occurred, administrative director or the persons that he might he or she might designate may conduct in investigations. And the ones that I'm most used to seeing are through the audit unit. Now, which may include, it's not limited to the audit of claims or utilization review, it can be other things. So you don't really have a handle on every piece of the investigation that may be conducted if you find yourself in this situation. So the investigation may be independent or targeted, or it may be conducted concurrently with a regular scheduled audit, the PAR audit as we know it. So penalty assessment. An administrative director may issue a notice of assessment in conjunction with an order to show cause pursuant to 10113 uh, under Title VIII of California Code of Regulations. And they normally would charge both an ad administrative penalty under this section and a civil penalty. And that's really guided by Labor Code 129.5. And that's done in the same pleading. So only one penalty may be imposed by the administrative director following the hearing on such charges. So there is a hearing. I've been uh, kind of helped defend a client on a couple of these. And you go through the hearing process. You're at the WCAB. And the fact pattern's laid out um, for the judge. And it's kind of the same process as the judge deciding what law applies, is this bad faith, you know, the factors of bad faith, does this follow in line with that or a precedent that happened before. Um, the administrative director or their designated people shall issue a notice of assessment for administrative penalties against, against the employer and you um, as follows. So, Really, penalty assessments are no joke, and I will tell you a short story. Um, you know, this is talking, the slide talks about knowingly violates 5814 with frequency that indicates a general business practice, um, is liable for administrative penalties of up to $400,000. And that money is put in the return to work fund that we're still using today to give injured workers um, additional funds. Um, I was. 20 some odd years ago, I was helping a, a friend and Tom Bradford said, go ahead, help your friend through this audit. So we helped, I helped her prepare and we were working on the files and then the audit unit came in and it quickly went downhill. Um, we were there six months for the audit and another six months after the audit, uh, cleaning up some stuff. And by the end of the day, we had assessed against us $1.2 million. It doesn't even sound possible. But it is possible and it did happen. And you can see from the $400,000, you know, up to $400,000, that number gets momentum very quickly if there's a business practice and there's a frequency of that business practice. So there's also $30,000 for each penalty award by the WCAB for a violation of 5814 for unreasonable delay or re refusal to comply with an existing compensation order. Now, there may be reasons that you want to not uh, abide by the order, but keep in mind there's legal processes that you need to go through in order to state your position. And our, you know, John and Bill on this call or any one of our attorneys really can help you through that. We have Lewis Lars, who is our appellate director, and he's very well versed and has handled many, many cases. So if there are questions in the future about I don't agree with this, how can I go about defending this? We have a lot of people that, that can help you with that. So for each penalty award by the WCAB for payments of temporary disability, salary continuation, life pension, or death benefits, here's how it kind of comes down. There's a penalty of $5,000 for 14 days or less of indemnity benefits. It goes up to $10,000 for 15 days through 42 days of indemnity benefits. And it goes thereafter up to 15,000 for more than 42 days of indemnity benefits. How many files do we normally have audited in, in our audits? Well, most 
facilities that have a sizable amount of inventory. I think it's 58 or, or 56, something like that. But then to get to this level, you've already gone through the uh, subsequent audits and you probably then are about 110 files that have been audited. Now think about 110 times these type of penalties and then you'll understand why you can get to $1.2 million if there are some things that are, are not being done by procedure. So it's so important, I'll say it at this juncture, and then I'm going to probably say it again down the road, but do self-audits. When you go back into your file, look at some things. Take a calendar and go down and make sure you're timely on every 14 days. Look at your benefit notices. You know, have you paid the, the money that is due? So for, penalty, for each penalty award by the WCAB, for authorization for medical treatment. And you'll see um, my, the, the example that I love to offer is many, many days ago, in my early claims days, there were some famous uh, applicant attorneys out there that like to go after home health care penalties. And they can legitimately do that. And normally there's big disputes on the home health care. Um, but here's the penalties. It, they're not really as bad as the penalties on some temporary disability, permanent disability benefits, but they are still there and still can add up. So $1,000 for retrospective medical treatment, $5,000 for prospective or concurrent medical treatment, and $15,000 for pr prospective or concurrent medical treatment when an employee is in a condition that is eminent, it's serious, and it's a threat to his or her health, and I would even say life. And when you have a threat to someone's life, and you have a decision in front of you that you can make or offer treatment or not make tra or offer treatment, and claims can be complex, and there's a lot of moving parts, this is when you involve all your partners, utilization review, you involve your management team, you need to bring these issues up. Because this, as you'll see through some of maybe examples that we might offer um, in this presentation, is where you maybe get caught up. You think you're doing the right thing. And because it was such a serious threat, if the trier of fact finds that you should have authorized this, can this fact become a bad faith situation? And, and it actually can, even if that was not your original intention. So feel free and make it a habit to involve those around you that um, either have more expertise in areas, can give you some advice, and make sure your management team always knows about these things so they can be in the loop and not be surprised. So for uh, each penalty award by the WCAB for reimbursement of employee for self-procured medical treatment. Um, and you know we think this shouldn't be a thing, but it is a thing. It's $1,000 for medical treatment cost of $100 or less, and that's excluding penalties and interest. Um, $2,000 for medical treatment for costs up to $300, and again, penalties and interest are separate. $3,000 for up to $500, and $5,000 for medical treatment uh, of $500 and greater, and those all exclude interest and penalties, which can be large. There's a penalty for $2,500 um, by the WCAB for supplemental job displacement benefits. Now, I myself have not seen that, but be aware, it does exist, and it's required by Section 10133.51b. It's the same section that includes what forms you're supposed to um, issue when you're I issuing an offer of return to work, and um, the other factors that go along with the supplemental job displacement benefits. So for each penalty awarded by the WCAB for violations of 5814, unreasonable delay or, re or refusal to make a permanent disability benefit payment, $1,000 for 15 weeks or less, 5,000, and it, it, you can see that it jumps exponentially for 15, but not more than 50 weeks. I'll give you an example on that prior slide. Um, that prior slide, the first one was 3%, something around there. Um, so it adds up very quickly and the weeks add up very quickly. Um, $7,500 for more than 50, but not more than 95 and $15,000 for more than 95 weeks of indemnity benefits. 
So let's talk about the components of 5814 allegations. Uh, when payments of compensation has been unreasonably delayed or refused, and it's prior to or subsequent to an award being issued. So the amount of the payment unreasonably delayed or refused shall be increased by up to 25% um, or $10,000 in, in this case, whichever's less. The appeals board issues and has discretion, pardon me, to um, make this decision. And what they're looking for is a fair balance and substantial justice between the parties. So if a violation is discovered, Sorry, does someone want to jump in? I jump in there on that one? Please do, please do. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in with a quick anecdote. Um, I did have a case a few years ago where we had a pretty tall order CNR, uh, just under six figures, and the adjuster uh, accidentally forgot to pay it. And so the applicant attorney, he sent me a bill of more than $10,000 um, under subsection A. And we actually, you know, we challenged it obviously. And we also were within the 90 days. So the 10% penalty was gonna be less than 10 grand anyway. But he actually didn't know about that $10,000 cap. And he said, you know, uh, you're actually the first one to bring that to my attention. Everyone else has just paid it out of embarrassment. Um, so. I did want to just bring that up because you do have some applicants attorneys who are willfully, intentionally, or maybe unintentionally um, sending out you know, penalty requests for more than 10 grand um, because they aren't knowledgeable about that statute, or maybe they are and they just want to see if you know about it. So that's all I got. Well, that's and I, want part, I want to be part of the party too, since you guys are here. Uh, I also Join want in. to throw something in there on this that I've noticed too is, is you know, one of the things that we have as defense attorneys in this case, for my defense attorney brethren out there, is it, normally we should have pretty good uh, working uh, relationships with applicants counsel. And I think in many cases, the applicants counsel just wants to make sure that their client might get a little bit more money and they might be willing to negotiate something without actually calling it a penalty. So. Before you start, uh, to John's point, before you start just making payments, have your counsel reach out to the other counsel and say, hey, okay, maybe we made a mistake. Apologies, namaste. Can we do something to make this go away so that we're not getting a 5814 and increase our audit unit? And I think most of the time it happens that way. Back to you in the studio. And here I am again. Thank you, Bill, for handing off the mic. <laughs> um, no, good points. Um, and here's, and I'm going to talk about some good news things. And John kind of look, uh, uh, led to it. Um, way to take my slide, John. No, I, I'm kidding you. But um, if the violation um, is discovered prior, if you discover this violation prior to the applicant alleging it, okay, and how do they allege it? They allege it in the form of a petition. Um, you have 90 days from the date of discovery to pay self-imposed penalty, and that amount is 10%, along with the amount that you hadn't paid previously. You can't just pay the 10% and not the, the other amount. So that, that's really the good news, um, and, and it gets better if this self-imposed penalty is paid within that 90 days, um, then it, it's in lieu of a penalty in subdivision A, which is 5814. Okay, so don't be afraid to pay a penalty that you owe and you'll save yourself in the end. So upon approval of a compromise and release, a finding an award, stipulation, and order, it shall be conclusively presumed that any accrued claim for penalty have been resolved. Okay, and regardless of whether a petition for penalty has been filed. So that's something you also need to keep in mind. That's why I know that all of the attorneys that I work with, we always want to include and not exclude any penalty issues that are being raised, even if the applicant attorney has raised them through a petition. Like Bill said, you see what you can do to make that happen. And unless the claim for a penalty is expressly excluded, and I've seen a couple cases most recently, there were two venued in San Diego where the applicant attorney knew about this uh, portion of the code and said, no, I'm going to specifically 
um, make them a part of or exclude them from the agreement and say, I intend you know, to pursue the penalties outside of our agreement. So we want to try to include them in the agreement, and if they're not excluded, then they are resolved. So no action may be brought to recover penalties under this section more than two years from the date of the payment of compensation due. So keep that in mind, there's actually a statute on that. Pay attention to dates. So, you know, what's, what's the point? Um, your file becomes an open checkbook, really. Um, and there's a whole lot more that goes along with that. Uh, the hoops that you have to jump through to say, hey, you know, I didn't mean for it to come out this way and it was really just a mistake. So be careful and be mindful of the decisions that you're making. And the burden really shifts to you to disprove the investigation findings. And sometimes you're dealing with the same audit unit that you deal with for PAR audits or subsequent to PAR audits. And you know, if you've experienced them enough times, that they may have a different view of, you know, what's going on. And the WCAB also may have a very different view on what is egregious, what is bad faith, than you may have. Okay, so um, it's important to self-audit along the way. I, and I said that before, this is the second time I'll say it. Just look at what you've done. Try to take a quick glance to see, hey, is everything timely? Um, do I have an MMI report? Am I paying the correct amount on permanent disability? What am I doing on my file and why am I doing it? So the beginning polls, um, Part of the reason for the, those was this very question, um, claims handling versus legal strategy. And, and let's just kind of talk about that. There, we're all on the same team and we're trying to get to the goal, but we do have different roles. So claims, you know this, you're responsible, you're at the wheel, okay? Um, paying what you owe timely is your responsibility. Sending notices to give instruction and guidance. If you thought about a notice, is not just an obligation, but it's also if you're going to pay a benefit or not pay a benefit or delay a benefit, whatever you're going to do, you're just giving instructions and you're giving guidance to that person who would be receiving the, the benefit or not receiving the benefit. So if you just make it a simple thing, I'm just giving you a courtesy letter to tell you why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's a good way to think about it. And wouldn't you want to know if it was you wanting to collect a benefit or, or know that you can't because you don't meet the criteria. So providing medical treatment, you have a UR system that you need to utilize, and that's always in accordance with your utilization review agreement. Um, there's some treatment that in your agreement, your contract, you may be able to authorize, for example, six visits of phys physical therapy or something, x-rays, other types of simple treatment. Um, and partnering, your obligation and your responsibility is partner with Bradford Barthel to move um, through the obstacles because really our legal strategy provides direction through a legal process. So we want to partner with you to work through that legal process to, you know, get over those obstacles. If it's a penalty obstacle, then get around that, get over it, just prove it, whatever we can do to benefit you and your, your company. So legal strate strategy really navigates opposing parties and the WCAB were kind of your frontline people. And so as much information as you can provide to us, um, that helps us in the field. And we thank you so much for your partnership, all of you. We're gonna move on to Bill. Bill, this is your fun part and I'm going to happily change the slides when you tell me to. So thank you for listening to my part. Thanks, nicely done, Sherry, appreciate it. So I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, when I started in workers' compensation over 20 years ago, I started as a law clerk handling penalties. And so I don't know, I'm, I'm sure there's many of you on here that remember the old days of the 25% for the species of benefit. 
And uh, gosh, back then there were just penalty petitions flying everywhere because applicants' attorneys uh, could use it, as, as Sherry said earlier, as a checkbook. And uh, I think the WCAB thankfully recognized that and, and minimized the penalties. So we don't see them quite as much as, as I think we did pre-2004, 2005, but they're still there and they're still critical. What I'm going to talk about is uh, over the last 20 years in, uh, in uh, representing insurance clients and other folks, um, I've encountered many cases of bad faith and I've been a part of many and my firm's been part of many. Uh, and so what I did is I created an amalgamation of facts because it's important to, to uh, convey what kind of facts are, are necessary to really pay attention to and to see the penalties that can occur from a single case handling. So um, if you have a case where the bad faith is so significantly egregious, it can result in not only penalties on that case, but it can, it can have a direct impact on the company at large, which is not something you want to do. So what I've done is I've uh, I created this not so hypothetical case, which is probably 15 separate cases over the years. So no, nothing specific, not calling out anybody, but wanted to give a little bit of example of some things that can happen. So uh, go ahead and uh, turn the slide there, please, Sherry. Thank you. So in this case that I've created, so the applicant suffered an admitted injury to her uh, right ankle, required surgery, and as a result of it, uh, had some serious infection, sepsis, which was later identified as a compensable consequence. You can go ahead, Sherry. Thank you. So the complication of sepsis, which is not fun, I'm guessing, thankfully never had it, knock on something, uh, but it caused significant extra uh, need for treatment, uh, including um, uh, orthopedic and internal injuries, and uh, ultimately affected this applicant's uh, kidneys. And so there were dialysis, dialysis considerations and an exacerbation of a pre-existing diabetic condition. And next slide, please. Couple more facts. So the the applicant again that I've created, and this has happened sadly in several cases, uh, had to to uh, uh, visit the hospital on several emergency uh, uh, occasions, and further had to be admitted and required additional treatment in the form of additional, like I said, dialysis and surgeries to her right knee. Eventually, the right knee was amputated, or I'm sorry, the leg was amputated. It'd be hard to amputate just the right knee. It's pretty much going to be all that part. And anyway, in the case that I've created here, uh, which again is very similar to some other cases, the uh, applicant's attorney went back and sought an amended award to have additional um, treatment and indemnity for the compensable consequence. Go ahead, Sherry, please. And in fact, the uh, award was issued, and even though the award was issued, treatment was denied. Now, the, the one case I had occurred, oh gosh, like right when I first started practicing in about 2001. And I remember back then that the uh, telling the adjuster, and just as a law clerk saying, uh, I think you need to provide treatment, and the adjuster, I, I guess they were going with their gut feeling, which we talked about earlier, instead of looking at the objective facts, continued to uh, not provide treatment. And uh, that case in particular ended up uh, to, to be problematic for that adjuster um, and, uh, and, the, and the company at, at large. But in this hypothetical that I've created, uh, the continued denial of care ultimately led to the uh, applicant having poor hospitalization and ultimately uh, passing away. The next slide, please. So some of the specific delays in these cases are, are things that seem kind of reasonable. So for, or not reasonable, but not overtly unreasonable. So for uh, example, the delay in providing a wheelchair, in, one, in that case from over 20 years ago, the, uh, the, the uh, adjuster I think provided the wheelchair just four months afterwards. So it wasn't you know six months or a year and this person's been suffering. But again, it was a pattern of practice and that the, uh, that the judge was just very irritated by. That was just one specific penalty. Uh, and again, back then, that was the 25% of the medical treatment, which was substantial. Uh, and, and critically also, their unreasonable delay in reimbursing Medi-Cal. 
As a result of denials of treatment, oftentimes uh, injured workers, I'm sure many of you guys have experienced this, will have to resort to their private insurance or to even Medi-Cal uh, to get treatment. If there's an order that Medi-Cal should be reimbursed and Medi-Cal isn't reimbursed, that's another penalty. Even though it nece doesn't necessarily involve current treatment with the applicant, the failure to reimburse Medi-Cal, especially after an, uh, an order, is absolutely uh, deserving of another penalty. Okay, next slide, please. So what, what uh, we took one of these cases on appeal back, uh, back in the day. And one of the, the statements I received from the WCAB that really stuck with me was this one. It's, it's that the employer slash insurance company has both the right and duty to investigate the facts in order to determine its liability, but they must act with expedition, that's an important word, in order to comply with the statutory provisions for the payment of compensation, including treatment. We have a, a really smart guy in Bradford Barthel, his name's Tim Musack, he does rating trading. And what Tim always says is that as, as defense counsel and as, as claims adjusters, we are obligated to provide injured workers with the benefits that they are entitled to, not one penny less, not one penny more. So what that implies is we should know, okay, so most of these folks are going to get benefits. And it's important to, to make sure they're not, you know, uh, exaggerating them, their benefits. I do that every day. That's kind of my job. But to make sure that also they're not being denied benefits that they should get. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in these cases, uh, the WCAB uh, found that the, the safeguards to protect applicants were not being adhered to. And in fact, in some of these cases, the uh, adjusters weren't even sending uh, the treatment request to utilization review. And anytime there's that kind of defiance of an order or, or uh, willful neglect of the obligation to provide benefits, you're going to get a penalty. Next slide, please. Thank you. So again, um, oh, and, and in, in a couple of these cases, uh, it's important to also note that the single case resulted in a referral to the, to the audit unit. So from what Sherry was saying earlier, most of the audits I think are brought about by a pattern of behavior over time. But it's also possible that, that egregious conduct on specific cases can lead to a referral of the to the audit unit on one case. So for the adjusters out there, make sure that, and we can go to the next slide, please. For the adjusters out there, here, here is the, the critical thing to remember, and for the attorneys to make sure that you're uh, properly advising and representing your clients. Make sure that when you're denying benefits to consider the potential for a bad faith denial. Now, I'm not saying don't deny benefits. It's important to do that. In many cases, it's absolutely appropriate. But make sure that when you do so, you have the documentary evidence to support your uh, denial. So always have the legal and factual grounds. Uh, in some cases, there may be a QME report that says, hey, this is a compensable injury. Well, maybe you have a post-termination defense, or maybe you have a good faith personnel action defense. That is fine, and you should assert those defenses, but you should have two things. You should, A, make sure, again, that you have the facts to back it up, and B, that you do it timely. So if you just kind of rest after the QME report comes in or, or you're not meaningfully asserting your, uh, your factual defenses, then a judge may say, okay, look, counselor, or look, defendant, you've had your opportunity and you've squandered it. And in fact, that squandering of that opportunity has led to injury for the applicant and therefore we're awarding some more penalties. So again, it's just important to remember that actions taken by each of us uh, can result in penalties and, and referral to the audit unit, and nobody wants that on their resume. John, on to you. Okay. Thank you, Bill. And uh, just answering a quick question on the voucher, uh, I think I found the correct code section in there. So just uh, pasting that into the answers there. And um, anyway, uh, trial time on bad faith is my part of the presentation. And in short, I've defended some uh, bad faith and sanctions cases at trial before. And so here's uh, some, some bullet points, uh, major categories we'll cover here in the next few minutes. So number one, be firm but polite at trial. Secondly, have all your docs in a row. 
Third, be careful with characterizations and how you state facts. Make sure that they're accurate. Four, is their house clean? Five, minimize, minimize, minimize damages. Six, be prepared or at least cautious about appealing. And we'll unpack those now. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, being firm but polite and taking the high road, often uh, these types of trials, arguments can get real heated. And so my role is to show the judge that while I really care about the issue, I'm not gonna yell or bark or behave un unprofessionally. Uh, conversely, if I can highlight my opponent's unprofessional behavior, perhaps I can swing that as leverage to our side. Next slide. Secondly, have all your docs in a row. So well before the MSC and these types of trials, I'm going to ask you for a plethora of docs, and that's going to definitely annoy you. And I'm not doing it just to bug you. Uh, what I'm looking for is in that third bullet point, I'm looking in that huge pile of docs for that needle in the haystack. And it's something to list as a trial exhibit, which you may have forgotten about, uh, something that, that shows that, hey, we aren't liable for bad faith. We were actually trying to do something good here, and the other party ignored us. And see, sometimes if the other party ignored you, uh, it's their fault, or they may have waived that issue. And you know, insurance companies and TPAs and defendants issue so many documents, it, that's a really important part of defending bad faith and sanctions, is seeing if there is that magic bullet out there. Um, on that second bullet point, by the way, if you are sending something out to an opposing party, uh, I recommend that you always use a proof of service if it's important. I can't tell you how many times that's come up. And proofs of service just make it all simpler. So if it's important, we highly recommend that you do use a proof of service. Um, also, another place we'll be looking is notes in the medical reports that undermine the applicant's attorney's narrative. And often there are uh, little notations by the doctors, uh, either in the workers' comp doctors' uh, reports or in these subpoenaed records. And doctors and nurses are pretty diligent, and sometimes it may just be a two or three word phrase that is going to contradict applicants' attorney's narrative. So that's another uh, area of the docs that we'll be looking. Next slide, please. And another uh, element of these is that applicants' attorneys often struggle with document management and they're probably totally unaware of half of the documents that we're looking at, or maybe a third of them. Um, another thing is that it's easy for an applicant's attorney who's on offense, 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 to get caught up in a false narrative. In fact, they think they've got you nailed on this issue, on this issue and then they're gonna suggest three other issues, and oh gee, maybe this fourth other issue should apply. And, uh, and so basically, they can get ahead of themselves and the documents can negate that and contradict their false narrative. Um, so when they do that, it gives us the opportunity to, to rebut what they're presenting out there and suggest that applicant's attorney actually has no idea about the real facts in the case. Judge, look at exhibit B, that completely contradicts what they're saying. Yeah, those are the real facts, this document that was generated two years ago, not just thrown out on the fly today. Next, please. And another area we're going to look at is their house clean. People who live in glass houses should not be throwing stones. So if I can find wrongdoing in their pleadings or practices, I'm going to definitely highlight that. And if I do, I can swing that to try and turn the tables back on them and allege costs and sanctions under Labor Code 5813. Next slide. And so Labor Code 5813, is a double-edged sword, and that's why we don't wield it all the time, um, because it's it's something. If you're going to assert that and go after costs and sanctions, your house better be clean. So, what does this uh, statute say? It says that the appeals board can order costs, sanctions, attorneys' fees, expenses if those were incurred by bad faith tactics or actions, or frivolous actions, or actions that were solely intended to delay. So if applicant's attorney oversteps and starts making bad faith or false allegations, uh, I will ask for Labor Code 5813 in my, my, my reply brief. And uh, that is actually something you do tend to see in more heated trials uh, like these. Next slide, please. So another element is 
minimizing damages. It's one of the first things they teach you in remedies in law school is if you're playing defense, it wasn't all that bad. And so while applicants attorneys like to toss around that phrase, bad faith, was there any actual harm as a result? That's a key question to ask. And harm can be prejudice, it can be cost, it could be the medical outcome, it could be a delay that, uh, for one of the parties. And is, is there a price tag associated with any of those things? So we're going to try and minimize those at trial. Another important element to keep in mind, and this kind of circles back to the poll question about the gut early on, is take care to avoid misstatements. And sometimes we have on our side a belief that later turns out to be untrue. And I need to correct, correct that uh, first sentence there. And so a good example of this is early on in the case when we're doing our initial investigation, you know, in the first 90 days, uh, one of the key witnesses says, that applicant's a liar. But later on, we find out that all the other witnesses say, oh no, actually the applicant is right. Uh, they called me that day and they said, you know, I was injured on the job. And they also called Bill down the hall. And then they also called Sherry. And yeah, we all had the conversation about how they slipped and fell and hurt, that knee, hurt their knee that day. And so they definitely weren't lying. So we have to be careful about repeating those misstatements in our trial pleadings or trial briefs is that is sanctionable. We don't want to repeat that kind of stuff in our petitions for recon. And so while it's annoying, we often can't go with the gut in our pleadings. We have to make sure that there's a good factual or evidentiary basis for stuff which we're saying is facts. And it takes the emotion out of it. Um, another thing you want to do is even though you may be really mad at the trial judge who ruled against you, you have to avoid getting personal with the judge. Um, and avoid getting personal with the applicant's attorney as the board does not look upon that favorably. And I know I'm running up against 1 p.m. So uh, next slide, please. Um, and we've seen panel decisions with this fact pattern. Trial doesn't go as planned. Uh, the, either party, it could be the defense attorney or applicant's attorney, files a petition for a recon with half-truths. And that's actually a phrase that you'll see in these panel decisions. And that half truth may be something about what a state agency did or did not do. And the state agency sees that petition for recon and they say, oh no, that's not true. Yeah, what they're saying, that's not true at all. We actually did respond to that. So those half truths can lead to large sanctions or threats of large sanctions down the road. And so you may wanna make an allegation in, in your pleadings, but it better not be a half truth. And a good example of that is that I sent you this document but you didn't respond when in reality I did send it to you and you did respond. And so we're up on our full hour. Um, and so with that, let me uh, kick it over to Tammy and Sherry and Bill. Uh, do we have any questions uh, that we wanna take a shot at right now? Uh, no, there was just an interesting question I just answered about um, a voucher, if there's a penalty for a voucher when the voucher is included within the CNR, if it's not paid within 30 days, I think yes. I think if any any benefit in included within a CNR would necessarily have, be, have to be paid pursuant to the terms of the CNR, just like you would pay a regular indemnity. But uh, I think we're good on other questions now. Tammy, unless you saw some. No, thank you all so very much. We appreciate you. We appreciate all of you for attending today. Certificates for CE and MCLE will be emailed this afternoon. Uh, you can find the PowerPoint on our external website under training and today's event. Uh, per your wonderful feedback, we have created this big blue button that says view PowerPoint PDF under each event so it's easier to find. It was hard to find a link before, so thank you for that suggestion. We've made those changes. Uh, and we always post the PowerPoint to our training page after or right before each webinar. Our next webinar is on March 14th at noon on Joinder, setting the table for resolution of cumulative trauma claims with Lauren Coleman and Nasir Adil from our Oakland location. Thank you all again so much for joining us and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week. Take care everybody. Thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody.